So now that we've thoroughly covered uh, the transcription side of the gene expression story, we can continue our analysis of gene expression by now moving forward and looking at translation. The next several flowcharts will be entitled Translation, and we're going to start with Translation 1. So in this flowchart, which is going to serve as more of an introductory flowchart, we're going to be looking at the following thing. So let's call this flowchart Introduction to Translation. And this is going to specifically give us uh, a very good working definition of what translation is, and we're going to build off of that. Translation can be defined as the synthesis of a polypeptide, PP, from mRNA, and this is all occurring in the cytoplasm. So now we have a change of venue as opposed to our original venue of the nucleus where transcription happened, we have taken that mRNA, either we've modified it if we're a eukaryote or just not modified it, and we've transferred it now to the cytoplasm, and in the cytoplasm we're going to have translation occur. This is going to be the whole idea of building a protein, because remember our overall dogma is DNA, which serves as our blueprint, will turn into RNA, Hopefully it turns into a mature RNA eventually through transcription, and now it's time to look at this process of going to a protein through TSN, as I like to call it, or translation. So let's look at this. A very first thing that I want to do is a summary of the three steps of translation so that we have a working idea of what we're about to see. It's a good idea to summarize these three complicated steps, but it's interesting and sort of easy for you because these steps are the same steps as seen in transcription, but with a bit of modifications. So the first step, just like in transcription, is known as initiation. In the initiation, a summary of the initiation of translation, we can state that this is when the mRNA specifically, which came from as a result of transcription, binds to the ribosome. Why the ribosome? Because the ribosome is located in the cytoplasm and our a whole translation process will be occurring in the cytoplasm because that's where the ribosome is. So the mRNA binds to ribosome. Good. Check. Next, uh, in order for initiation to happen, we also have the tRNA, which we'll talk about in this video. The tRNA is going to uh, bring in, so tRNA brings the first amino acid, AA, and binds to the ribosome as well. So we have a lot of binding to the ribosome in this initiation step that we'll get into more details as we move forward. In step two, we have to undergo elongation, just like we did in transcription. In translational elongation, we're going to have the situation in which the tRNA molecule, which is a transfer RNA, continues bringing an amino acid, it continues bringing um, many amino acids because we're trying to elongate our polypeptide chain, our protein eventually. So the tRNA continues bringing amino acids in hopes of elongation and then as this continuous uh, sort of bringing of amino acids happens, the ribosome, which is a major, major player in translation, the ribosome covalently links those amino acids together. Covalently links uh, amino acids, uh, that's an L, that's an I, amino acids, um, and this is all based on, of course, the mRNA template, okay? Now the mRNA is serving as a template. Before the DNA was our template, now our RNA is going to be our template for our protein. This is literally the language of the RNA being translated translated, translation, into the amino acid language of proteins. DNA and RNA had a very similar language, just the difference was in one letter of the uracil versus the thymine, but now we're actually translating into a completely new language known as the amino acid language, as stated by 1 and 2. And then finally, in terms of our summary, we end with termination, just like we did in our transcription series. But in this termination, what we're going to happen is, what's going to happen is the ribosome reads a stop codon. So it reads a stop codon. 
And because it reads a stop codon, of course, translation will stop. So translation stops. And in addition, when translation stops, we get the falling off of many different structures, mRNA, tRNA, and even the polypeptide chain itself, the PP, the polypeptide, PPC, the polypeptide chain, um, is released. It all falls apart at the end with termination. So we'll see that as we move forward. So that's a good working summary of translation. Now the final thing I want to talk about, and it's a big idea here, is this tRNA molecule that I keep on mentioning several times within our process. Let's figure out what tRNA is and how it gets its status as a transfer RNA molecule. So tRNA is going to be, um, let's look at its sort of its birth. Its birth is also going to be similar to mRNA. It's transcribed from uh, DNA genes. So DNA genes can turn into mRNA, they can turn into rRNA, and they can also turn into tRNA, transcribed from DNA. So DNA can turn and make tRNA molecules. So again, DNA is always the blueprint. That's why I haven't put M here or R here or T here. It's just the general RNA molecule will always be transcribed through DNA. So we have that first idea of tRNA and its birth. In addition, I want to give a very basic function of tRNA so that we understand what tRNA's purpose is. The basic function behind tRNA is to bind and bring Okay, bind and bring, two basic ideas, bind and bring, but more specifically, the amino acid to mRNA, okay, bind and bring amino acid to mRNA on ribosome. So this is all occurring at the cytoplasm, at the ribosome, the mRNA is dictating, it's a template, it's telling the uh, ribosome, I need a complement to my mRNA sequence, I need an anticodon, which we'll get to, to my codon, Please bind and bring a tRNA molecule here so that we can translate a polypeptide chain eventually. So that's our function. And now in a very important part of tRNA, tRNA is its structure. And this is where it can get a bit confusing, but it's very simple if you look at it from the detailed perspective. The structure of a tRNA molecule, very simply speaking, is single-stranded and it contains about, that's SS, about 80 nucleotides. So single-stranded and 80 nucleotide structure. So it doesn't seem too complex in that sense, but then if we dissect it even further, we start to see the complexity behind these tRNA molecules. They have a very distinct 3D structure as well. If you look at a picture in your textbook or any Google image of a tRNA, you will see a 3D structure with a bunch of complementary, C-O-M-P, B-P, which will stand for base pairing. This complementary base pairing of this uh, tRNA structure will eventually result into the classic folded and looped overall structure of tRNA. So it gives it a very noticeable, a very classic folded and looped structure, 3D structure of tRNA. Now, with structure always comes function. So let's look at the function specifically. One of these loops that, may, that is made through this interaction of complementary base pairing is going to be known as the anti-codon loop. Anti-codon loop. So now we've seen one part of this word before. We've seen codon before, but now there's an anti-codon. The codon, if you remember, is the way the mRNA, the RNA, has a language, and it speaks in codons, which are three-letter words, let's say, that code, codon, for an amino acid. There's also going to be a complement to that codon known as the anticodon, and that anticodon will be found on the tRNA molecule at a specific anticodon loop. We can define the anticodon as simply three bases, because the codon is three bases, then the anticodon will be three bases. Three bases that recognize, that recognize and bind, because again, look, binding and bringing, that recognize and bind to, of course, the mRNA codon. The mRNA language will now be translated into the amino acid language through this anticodon-codon relationship. This binding and recognizing has to be and will be anti-parallel, of course, and it will also be complementary, C-O-M-P for complementary. I can give you a very basic example of this by looking at the following uh, idea. So we're going to do it over here. Basic example would be that I have a tRNA molecule, right? 
This tRNA molecule will have the following structure. It will have an anticodon structure of a 3' end, which will yield and have a UAC 3 codon triplet, 3 bases on its anticodon loop, that is also going to be closed off by a 5' end. This is considered our anticodon. Okay, anticodon. So of course now I have to create something that's anti-parallel and complementary. So let's do the complementary first. What's complementary to you in the language of mRNA? Of course that's going to be an A. What's complementary to an A? That's going to be a U. Now it would be T, but we're talking about RNA language right now. So the RNA language utilizes this U, and complementary to a C is of course the letter G. So we have AUG, now I'm going to do the anti-parallel nature, thus I'm going to go 5 prime on this end and 3 prime on my other end because this is anti-parallel. And this is now going to be my mRNA molecule. This is my mRNA molecule that I made through transcription and thus it provides me with a codon that can be read and matched with an anticodon. This is of course, if you recognize, this is our start codon. This will eventually code for methionine, our starting amino acid. So you see what we did here? We just did translation. What we did was we took an amino acid, a mRNA language of three codon triplets and turned it into a completely new language that says AUG means methionine. This is TSN right here, translation into methionine. And finally, we're going to close off tRNA by looking at the idea that there are 20 tRNAs for 20 amino acids. Okay, so how does this relationship happen? So we have 20 tRNAs for 20 amino acids because we have 20 what are known as amino acyls. So I'll write 20, they're called amino acyl tRNA synthetases. Okay, so we have this ASE ending. This means that there are 20 uh, enzymes that are going to be devoted to the following thing. These 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases enzymes are going to do the following enzymatic process. They're going to catalyze covalent bond, the linking, the formation of a covalent bond between, of course, an amino acid and what would an amino acid want to bind to in a tRNA situation? The tRNA itself, of course. So in order to have a tRNA, bring and bind this amino acid, you have to have the binding happen separately. This binding is catalyzed by a synthetase enzyme that's going to take an amino acid that's floating around and see a tRNA that has its associated anticodon loop and say, okay, let me bind you together. I'm going to bind you utilizing my enzymatic quality. It actually also, this process, uses energy, uses ATP. So overall, what happens here and so to conclude is that we have finally created something called, this creates an amino acyl tRNA. When you see a tRNA that's amino acyl, you automatically state and think that this tRNA is now considered a charged tRNA, a charged tRNA. And what do you think charged tRNA means versus uncharged? An uncharged tRNA molecule is a molecule of tRNA that does not have its amino acid on it. But if it's charged, if it has the amino on it, the amino acyl tRNA, it is considered charged. Thus, it is um, going to be ready charged tRNA. It's ready to bind to mRNA, of course, and continue the process of translation going through these three steps, which we'll now further look at.